Chapter Eight, Miss Crawley. Old Miss Crawley was now living in Brighton, and she read the news of the Battle of Waterloo with great interest. Rawdon had been promoted; he was now a colonel. What a pity that fine young man behaved as he did," said the kind-hearted Briggs. She wanted Miss Crawley to forgive Rawdon and Becky. Rawdon's a fool," the old lady replied angrily. "He could have married well if he'd had my money behind him. Oh, but he won't get any of it now." Rawdon and Becky took good care to write regularly to Miss Crawley, and the old lady was amused by their letters, although she knew perfectly well that it was Becky who wrote them and not her nephew. Miss Crawley's attitude to the family at the rectory was not so warm. She'd been frightened by Mrs. Bute Crawley during her illness in London. Worse than that, she'd been bored by the rector's wife. Still, presents of farm produce arrived regularly at Miss Crawley's house in Brighton, with tender notes of affection from the family at the rectory. Rawdon's brother Pitt was also attentive to his aunt. He came frequently to Brighton to visit his fiancée. Lady Jane Sheepshanks, who lived in the town with her sisters and mother, the formidable and religious-minded Countess Southdown. Pitt hinted to Lady Southdown that it might be beneficial for her family to make a friendship with his aunt. He told her that Miss Crawley was now all alone in the world. I'll certainly visit the poor lady. The Countess responded enthusiastically. I'll leave her some religious literature as well. No, my dear lady," said the artful Pitt. "She has been seriously ill, and she has not been accustomed to think of spiritual matters. We must proceed slowly. Besides," he added quietly, "we don't want to frighten the poor lady. She has seventy thousand pounds. Think of that." Countess Southdown nodded her head in agreement. The next day, the Southdown carriage pulled up outside Miss Crawley's house. The visit was a great success, and Miss Crawley took particularly to Pitt's fiancée, Lady Jane. Pitt was in high spirits and spent his time daydreaming about the old lady's seventy thousand pounds. News of the friendship between Pitt Crawley and his aunt soon reached the rectory, and Mrs. Bute Crawley decided to make one further effort to win the old lady's fortune for her family. She sent her son James to visit Miss Crawley. James was a student. He was a simple young fellow, more interested in sport and beer than in his studies. He was no match for Pitt Crawley. The older man encouraged him to drink too much wine and led him on to entertain the ladies with some exciting sporting stories. James swayed drunkenly up the stairs to his bedroom. When he arrived there, he opened the window and lit his pipe. He stared happily out at the sea, smoking contentedly. He had forgotten, however, to close the bedroom door behind him, and the smell of pipe tobacco spread through the house. The following morning, he received a note from Briggs. Dear sir, Miss Crawley has spent a sleepless night because of the smell of pipe tobacco throughout the house. She is too unwell to see you before you leave the house. And so ended the rectory family's hopes of receiving Miss Crawley's fortune. Rawdon and Becky, meanwhile, were enjoying themselves in Paris, where they had enough money to live in luxury thanks to the huge price Jos had paid for the horses. Becky gave birth to a son during their stay in Paris. Miss Crawley was furious at the news and immediately ordered Pitt and Lady Jane to marry. She promised to leave them the bulk of her fortune after her death. The newlyweds settled into Miss Crawley's Brighton home. And they were all ruled over by Lady Southdown from her neighbouring house. Lady Southdown was so terrifying that Miss Crawley lost all her cheerfulness. She even began to treat Briggs kindly as she moved slowly towards death. The old lady died, clinging in fear to Lady Jane. Chapter Nine, Life. On nothing a year, news was continually arriving in England of the terrible casualties of the Battle of Waterloo. The Osborne family learned of George's death. Old Mister Osborne was grief-stricken, but he carried on his business as usual. He never mentioned George's name to anyone. One day, Dobbin's father, Sir William Dobbin, called at Mister Osborne's house. My son has sent me a letter for you, he explained. Mister Osborne looked at the letter, 
and his heart began to beat quickly. The writing was his son's. It was the letter George had written before leaving Amelia in Brussels. Mr. Osborne suffered greatly in this period. He travelled to Belgium to visit the site of the historic battlefield, and he saw George's burial place. One evening, as he was coming back into Brussels, Mr. Osborne saw a carriage driving towards him. An officer was riding by the side of it. Mr. Osborne was surprised to see that one of the occupants of the carriage was his son's widow, Amelia, and that the officer on horseback was his son's friend, Dobbin. Amelia was pale and withdrawn, and did not notice her father-in-law. He, however, gazed at her in fury and hatred. A few minutes later, Dobbin rode up to Mr. Osborne's carriage. He held out his hand, but Mr. Osborne refused to take it. I have a message for you. I am the executor of George's will, and am therefore responsible for his widow's welfare. Are you aware how little money he left her? Dobbin explained that Emilio was expecting a child. He tried to persuade Mr. Osborne that the time for hatred and bitterness was gone, and that Emilia needed his support. I have promised to have nothing to do with that woman, sir, Mr. Osborne commented angrily. I shall not change my mind. Months now passed, and Amelia gave birth to a son. The loyal Major Dobbin was constantly in attendance upon her, and brought her back to her parents' house in England. He became the baby's godfather. The poor girl was so depressed by the death of George that she did not seem to notice the Major's kindness to her. Dobbin, however, never dared to mention his love to her. He knew that Amelia was loyal to her husband's memory. One day, the Major came to Amelia's house, looking particularly serious. I'm going away, he told her. I shall be gone a long time. You'll write to me, won't you, my dear? I'll write to you about little Georgie, Amelia replied with a smile. How kind you've been to us, dear William. Three or four years after their triumphant stay in Paris, Rawdon Crawley and Becky were living in a fine little house in Curzon Street, Mayfair. They entertained their friends splendidly, yet there were few of their friends who did not sometimes wonder how Colonel Crawley managed to live so well. He did not seem to have any income at all. There are many people in Vanity Fair who succeed very well on nothing a year, the Colonel, for example, was an excellent card player and excelled at billiards and other games of chance. He spent many evenings playing against his friends and his winnings provided him and Becky with the small amounts of cash they required. For the rest, the couple lived on credit, as many others in Vanity Fair are obliged to do. The house in Curzon Street belonged to Mr Raggles, who had previously been Miss Crawley's butler. After leaving Miss Crawley's service, Mr. Raggles and his wife had bought a shop selling foodstuffs. They worked hard and saved their money carefully. After many years, Mr. Raggles was able to buy the little house in Curzon Street. He intended to rent out the property and was delighted to have a member of the Crawley family as his tenant. The young couple also ordered their food from Raggles' shop. One of Becky's first plans when they settled in London was to establish good relations with Rawdon's brother, Pitt. He had inherited most of Miss Crawley's fortune. Although Rawdon and Becky had their house in Mayfair and gave select little parties there, society ladies did not want anything to do with Becky. They had heard too many unpleasant stories about her from people like Lady Bearacres. Most of the visitors to Curzon Street were gentlemen. Becky found this position humiliating, and she determined to do something about it. One of the regular visitors to the Crawley household was Lord Steyne, a great and powerful nobleman who occupied a very strong position in London society. Lord Steyne was one of Becky's greatest admirers. Becky thought that Lord Steyne could introduce her to London society. This was not a happy time for Rawdon himself. He knew that people came to the house to see his brilliant and charming wife, and that they found him a bore. He preferred to spend his time with his little son, Rawdon. He went for long walks with the boy, and he took him to see his old friends at the barracks. Chapter 10 Misleading Letters Joss Sedley returned to India after his adventures in Brussels. 
he sent a small amount of money to his parents to maintain their modest little house in Fulham. The Sedley household lived in a very small way. Old Mr Sedley tried various little business schemes in an effort to recover his fortune, but all of them came to nothing. Amelia herself had no thoughts for anything except her son. The family received few visitors now that Dobbin was abroad again, although the local curate at the church where they worshipped called quite often. People said the reason for his calls was Amelia, but she took little notice of the young man. The years went by, and George grew into a healthy young boy. He was full of energy, and everyone said he looked just like his father. Old Sir Pitt Crawley died, to the relief of all his family. He had become increasingly eccentric in his final years, and his behaviour had been a scandal throughout the county. His son, Pitt, inherited the property and the title, and as he'd already inherited Miss Crawley's fortune, he was now a man of substance and importance. His thoughts turned to a career in politics. Rawdon and Becky were, of course, invited to attend the old man's funeral at Queen's Crawley. Becky received the invitation with delight. Why are you so happy about it? Rawdon asked in astonishment. There's no money coming to me from my father's death. You don't really want to go, do you? Of course we're going, Becky cried. Lady Jane shall present me at court next year, and Pitt will give you a seat in Parliament. What about little Rawdy? Is he coming with us? Rawdon asked tenderly. He did not like being parted from his son for more than a few days. No, said Becky. He can stay here with Briggs. She'll look after him. The faithful Briggs had come to work for the young couple after Miss Crawley's death. The visit was a great success for Becky. She behaved herself with modesty and tact in front of the new Sir Pitt Crawley and flattered his political ambitions. She talked sentimentally about her son in front of the kind-hearted Lady Jane and won that lady's friendship. With Lady Jane's mother, the Countess of Southdown, she talked religion. Amelia, meanwhile, wrote regularly to Major Dobbin, who was with the army in India. She gave him all the news about Georgie. She also visited his sisters sometimes. One day, the sisters told her some important news. William's, William's getting, getting married. married! She wrote to congratulate him and to wish him happiness for the future. Georgie went to see Dobbin's sisters by himself sometimes, and he came back from one such visit wearing a beautiful gold watch. He said that a lady had given it to him. Amelia guessed that the lady was a member of the Osborne family. In fact, it was George Osborne's sister who had also been visiting the Dobbin sisters. When Miss Osborne arrived home that afternoon, she told old Mr Osborne that she had seen Georgie. He looks just like his father, she said tearfully. The old man did not reply, but he went very red in the face and began to shake with emotion. He still hated the Sedleys, but he wanted to see his grandson. Slowly a plan began to form in his mind. Dobbin was astonished to receive Amelia's letter congratulating him on his coming marriage. It was true that Peggy O'Dowd had been trying to persuade him to marry a relative of hers, but Dobbin was in love with Amelia. He was not interested in any other girls. When he read Amelia's letter, he realised that she did not understand what he felt for her. Don't you realise that it's you I love? He thought. Don't you remember how I looked after you when George was killed? How I brought you safely back to England? A little while later, Dobbin received another letter from England. His sisters told him about Amelia. She's going to marry the curate at her local church, they wrote. And George is going to live with his grandfather. Both pieces of news disturbed Dobbin very much. Amelia will not marry again, he thought. And I'm sure she'll never give up Georgie to Mr Osborne. He suspected that she was in trouble, and once again he was determined to help her. He immediately asked for urgent leave to go to England. 